Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. We don't really need a mic, but I can't wait to do it. So, um, thanks very much for coming to um, this this talk. I will get into a little bit about what the talk is about, obviously. We can actually have the talk. Um, but a little bit about um, the nature of why, we, why this talk is important for us um, in a minute. First, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is John Curie. I am the founder of a 22-year-old project called the Mind Time Project. And the Mind Time Project has been about um, exploring the world of thinking, exploring our inner world, and trying to understand how exactly it is that we perceive the world. And we'll get to that in a minute. The relevance and why I'm here and why I have been here on campus at various times over the last year is really the bigger question. So um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. They're not trick questions. They're very, very straightforward. But they, uh, I'd like to get us thinking in a certain way. Um, what is it that you find most challenging here at the university? And, and, and I mean personally challenging as opposed to, you know, if I'm not parking or need a rec room. But what's the, what's the thing? Yeah. The amount of work. So it's actually like, you know, wow, how do I deal with this? Well, what might be something else? Is that it? In other words, yeah. So it's along the same lines, but time management. Just trying to figure time out how to do Trying to figure out how to pack it all in. Yeah. It could be another one. Does anyone find it challenging when sitting down, you know, doing chemistry? Just like, you know, really look at how to learn chemistry by road. Is that challenging for anyone, or do you like to do that? A bit challenging? Yeah. Okay. And so there's, for other people, a different kind of challenge, which is actually doing lab work and actually having to work with the dummies if you're doing that yet. Um, for example, where there's simulation. And some people find that really challenging. And I would guess that actually if we went around and we asked everybody what your own personal challenge was, we would actually see differences between you. We would see differences between you. So the point of, the point of mind's time in the context of Samuel Merritt University, which I think is what I'm really trying to get to, is that mind time is a way for us to understand ourselves as individuals. And in understanding ourselves, we begin to become aware of the relationship, the nature of the challenge that we might be experiencing, and ourselves. So for example, I don't find it particularly challenging to be thrown into an absolutely chaotic situation where there's a huge problem and have to solve it instantly. I actually find that really simple. And yet, if you give me a book to sit down and to read and study, and you try to examine me after my reading that book, I find that immensely difficult. And in some ways, those two things are absolutely antithetical to each other. They're incredibly different. One of them is there's no information. It's suddenly spontaneous. You just have to deal. And the other one is you've got all of this information that you can glean, and you can learn, and you can study. And at the end of it, all you have to do is sit down and remember what it is that you read and studied. So totally different kinds of situations, and yet some of you will respond, like me, very well to that sudden crisis right in front of me sort of situation, as a paramedic might need to be able to do. And other of you will be far, far better, as perhaps a pharmacist or a chemist might need to do, to be able to actually recall a lot of information and do something. The point being this, each of us has our own particular strategy for perceiving the world around us, for informing ourselves, for engaging in that world, and in some ways we can say for feeling safe. How is it that you personally feel in your own sense of flow, in that sense of safety, security, you know what you're doing, you're in stride? Because ultimately when you feel that way, it is easier, isn't it? I mean, how, how many of you would rather actually have yourself going against the grain, feeling stressed most of the time? Oh, very few. Most of us would rather feel as though we could actually deal with whatever was in front of us with a relative amount of ease, a little bit of challenge, not bad. I guess the adrenaline up gets us going a little bit, but, but, but ease. We don't want friction. And so my time is a methodology for us to understand how it is that we can actually understand the thought processes we use in order to decrease the friction and create what we think of as resonance. Resonance meaning an evenness, a resonation between that which is trying to be done and the person trying to do it. So back to the context. In the context of Sun American University, what we're trying to do is to introduce mind time as a very, very simple framework with which we can understand both ourselves, other people, as well as contexts or situations. 
in such a way that we become aware of why it is that we're finding it challenging. So imagine all of a sudden you are confronted with something and no longer are you going like, damn, I just hate this. And the only word you can think of is, I hate this. That's the, that's the maximum ability of your expression to understand the difficulty you're having, hate. And you moved away from that and all of a sudden you were in a, oh, this is requiring me to think this way. I naturally think this way. There's the friction. Now I can go look at my handy dandy little pocket guide and I can actually take a look at how might I rethink my approach so that it was less stressful. That's what we're trying to do. Because I believe at the end of the day, if my experience of my own education was anything to go by, that if you can remove the stress, you increase the ability for individuals to learn and to appreciate themselves, to gain confidence, to gain the information that they need and to be able to use that information. And I believe that the more stress inherent in the system, whatever it comes from, the more energy, mental energy is going towards overcoming the obstacle before even getting to the learning. So that's my premise. Does anyone absolutely flat out disagree with my premise? No, it sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Okay. So that's why I'd like to tell you about mind time. It's a way of us understanding our thinking style. And our thinking style is, at the end of the day, at the very root of everything. So if you get a little <coughs> piece of paper out and a pencil, and if you don't have a piece of paper, there's a handy dandy piece of card on the other side, you'll find a link to a learning and a QR code you can use to get there. But the reverse side is actually blank. So if you have a pen handy, just let that piece of card over and you can use the reverse side. And that way you can keep it and take this card away because it has that useful URL. So I'm going to ask you to do a technical exercise. It's really, really simple. It doesn't require any brain power. You just need to use a little bit of your intuition, right? Here's a list of nine words. Nine words. And what I want you to do is to reorganize this list of nine words into three lists of three words. <coughs> nine words, reorganize them into three lists of three words. And there's only one rule I want you to follow in reorganizing these words. And the rule is this. Each of those lists that you end up with, with three words in them, needs to feel as though the words belong together. Feel as though the words belong together. So take the mind, sort them out into three little lists, and each list should feel as though all of the words in that list belong together. So just take a couple of minutes to quickly do that. Again, it's not a pass by a thing, but I think you'll be quite surprised by something. Managed to put the words all in the correct 100% right, just to get that for a second. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Not bad. How many of you got one wrong? Okay, we're now at around 75% of you got them all right, what is one wrong? So, as you can see, something quite remarkable happened. Because the question is, how did you do that? How did you actually know? what words feel like they belong together. 
What does that even mean? Feel like they belong together. They want to be the same. It's not like putting sheep and sheep and chickens and chickens. Those have a, like a feeling to them. But a word? So what's really going on? And how come not only could you do this, but that we've done this with thousands of people around the world of different cultures and different languages? And we get the same thing happening. An extraordinarily high number of people put the same words in the same lists. Well, I would put to you that this is suggested that in the midst of all of the chaos that we perceive around us, there is a deep, deep fundamental pattern. And that that deep, deep fundamental pattern is actually a secret way into understanding the nature of our thoughts. What we're going to talk today about is not actually the nature of our thoughts from the point of view of the content. Lord knows each of your minds is probably buzzing with all kinds of weird and wacky content from different places. That's not really that interesting if you think about it, although I know we personally feel our content is enormously interesting and everybody should listen to us. But that's actually not really that interesting. What's much more interesting and what's much more powerful is to understand not the content, but the nature, the structure, the form of our thoughts. Because what we have found out is that our structure, the form of our thoughts, has extraordinary not only kinships that we can actually understand why we resonate with certain people more than others, but it actually has an extraordinary power behind it, which is to tell us how it is that we can work more effectively in our thoughts together. How can someone who actually is very good at reading the chemistry book help me when I'm much better at that crisis situation? How can I, who am better at the crisis situation, help the person who's really good at getting the data? In other words, I'm not on my own. I'm not limited by my own ability. If I can actually figure out how to be combinatorial, how to bring what I have of value and combine it with what other people have, have of value, if we can figure that out, then all of a sudden we have extraordinary power, which is way beyond our own. <clears throat> We're no longer stuck in our own paradigm, our own ditch, our own, our own thing, if you will. So, how do these words end up in those three lists? The secret is patterns, patterns of thought. I'd like to tell you a little story very briefly. You've all probably seen the Jacques Cousteau films and things where there are those schools of fish that, that, that are being filmed on the water, all moving at exactly the same time in the same direction. It's like this huge battery of fish. Have you all kind of seen films like that? Schools of fish, sorry, yeah? Okay, well at least you know what I'm talking about more or less. So for years and years and years, and I mean hundreds of years, natural philosophers of every stripe have actually asked themselves the question, how do the fish know? How do they know to turn left, turn right, up, down? Because they all do it seemingly at exactly the same moment in time. So people have speculated over the centuries that this is through chemistry, through its light, it's like you know, telepathy, there's all kinds of weird and wonderful reasonings have come out to explain how the heck these fish actually know or to turn left or right at the same moment in time. And it turns out that just a few years ago, um, some people built a computer simulation, a model, to actually demonstrate what was going on. And it turns out that there are three very, very simple rules at work, not only in those fish, but in all of nature, to varying degree degrees <coughs> of complexity. <coughs> Birds do this, fish do this, higher order animals, primates do this, even we are doing this, is the point. The three rules are this. Rule number one, if it looks like you, stick close to it and travel in the same direction. Okay. If it looks like you, stick close to it and travel in the same direction. Think of this as the root, rule of tribes. Stick close to things that look like you and travel with them. Maintain that distance. Rule number two, if it looks like you can either feed it, feed from it rather, or you can fornicate with it, or you can fight it, in other words, take advantage, take opportunity. If you can do one of those three, go towards it. That's rule number two, go towards it. Rule number three is, if it looks like it's going to eat you, go in exactly the opposite direction. All right, number one, stick out. Number two, move towards food, or fornication, or fighting. Number three, if it looks like it's going to eat you, go in exactly the opposite direction. And when you know it, you program that into a computer, and there's little simulated fish 
do exactly the same thing as the fish do in the ocean. Now, why this was incredibly exciting for me was because I'd spent some uh, 18, 19 years exploring human thinking and had concluded that there were three patterns at work in all human thought. And one of those patterns has to do with creating stability, creating harmony by actually socializing, by bringing people together and creating a harmonious or stable or safe environment. Another rule was move towards the things that are possibilities or opportunities. And another rule was move away from those things that are risky. So in many ways, we can understand, if you will, the human condition, our thought processes at the most basic level as having two sets of dimensions. The first dimension is move towards food, move towards food, reward, possibility, opportunity. And that creates a certain kind of thinking, doesn't it? It's kind of spontaneous. It's in the moment. It's very much in flow. It's looking for always the next brightest thing. It loves change. Or you're moving away from risk. This is exactly the opposite direction, isn't it? If something looks like it's going to eat, you go in the opposite direction. So in other words, if something looks dangerous, risky, it might not only hurt you physically, but it might hurt your ego, it might hurt your reputation, you might risk failing in some way, like an exam. This particular rule is saying, move away from it. Go in the opposite direction. Run. <coughs> so there's those two dimensions. And then you also have the dimension which is, and I find this the most extraordinarily beautiful conceptualization of why it is that we are humans as conscious beings, which is if you can imagine being absolutely buried in the moment of now, I mean truly buried in the moment of now, there's no tomorrow, there's no yesterday, you literally are buried in that moment of now, it's all just happening right there, there's no you, there's no it, it's just an experience. And for us to actually have experience as human beings, we actually have to separate ourselves out, stand suddenly back from that moment of now, and realize that there was a moment before it, and there's a moment coming next. And it's that dichotomization, it's that movement into the awareness that I am separate from it, because I can remember as I was, and I can see the possibility of how I will be. That gives birth to human thinking. And so we go from being an absolute concrete space of experience and suddenly we are into what we think of as abstraction. Concepts, ideas, feelings, emotions, projections, judgments. These are all abstractions of our actual experience. And they stick with us in our memory. And every time we come across a similar experience, given our particular set of patterns or filters, our thinking, we re-experience old memories. And so I don't have to look at a big book and actually pick it up and try to read it to feel that certain anxiety that I probably will not succeed. I just have to remember the time, the first time I failed. It could have been when I was six years old. So that emotion is very, very deeply rooted in something. And what I now feel when I'm confronted with a similar situation is just this re-emergence, this reliving of that experience, plus anything new that's coming along. Do you see how important it is to get a hold of this stuff and to actually try to look at this all of that? Because most of us are spending an awful lot of our lives wound up in ideas and concepts and fears and stresses that actually don't exist right in front of us. And if we could understand how we thought, if we could understand actually what the patterns and mechanisms of our own perception and thinking were, we can undo that bit, we can untangle it. And in untangling it, free ourselves to actually be able to be far more powerful in our ability to learn, in our ability to engage, to express, and do all of the things that we want to do in life. So these two pieces, this A, the idea of coming out from the experience into abstraction and actually being conscious human beings, the subject, an object relationship, duality as they call it. And the idea that we are all either moving towards things, looking for the possibility, or we are moving away, avoiding a risk. If you take those two concepts, what you get is very simply the theory of mind time in a nutshell. There are three thought patterns all working in concert with each other. We all use all three of them. The degree to which we use any one of them in other words, how we personally blend those three patterns 
And that creates our thinking style. We don't seem to change that thinking style much over our lifetime. We can become more aware of both the resistances that we feel towards doing certain things, because we don't have a lot of that thinking pattern, if you will. And we can become aware of the dominance we have of always doing things a certain way, because we have a lot of that particular thinking pattern. In our awareness, and I'm talking about becoming more consciously aware of who you are and how you engage in the world, through that awareness, you can decrease the effects of that natural resistance. You can decrease the dominance if it's getting in your way as well. But I don't believe, we don't believe, that we can actually change the fundamental patterns, the fundamental wiring that represents the way that we've actually can come into this world and engaged in our own personal survival. What's important to understand is the differences between us are actually reflective of the value that we each bring to any single situation. If you have a lot of present thinking, the value you bring to a situation is quite literally the ability to <coughs> increase the probability of something actually figure, working out. A plan, reaching a goal, structuring things, creating a process. That's the value you bring, the present thinking. If you bring future thinking, you bring the value of solving problems very quickly. Of that drive towards change, the spontaneity of seeing and feeling more importantly, rising to the challenge and actually solving something that perhaps everybody else said it can't be solved. And if you have more of that past thinking pattern at work, then you bring that extraordinary gift, which is the ability to actually say, let's just wait and collect more information, and then know how to get that information, know how to validate that information so that you can reduce the risk. Because how often do we run forward into doing things before we've actually figured it out, only to figure out later that it was the wrong thing that we did. This has huge consequences for us as a society, of course. But even for us personally, if anyone, you're all too young to be married more than once, but I promise you, if you are someone who's been married more than once, they will probably tell you that something like rushing into it had something to do with what actually happened, or not thinking through it. Not everybody, there are other reasons why. But it quite often is that impulse, it's that, no, I didn't think about it, I was in love. Nothing wrong with it. Until afterwards, when you regret doing it, but you didn't think about it. <clears throat> right? So, maybe that's okay. But the point is, is we do have the mechanisms to think about the things we're going to do before we actually do them. That is, by the way, one of the unique traits of human beings. We can live a situation before we live the situation. It is pretty remarkable if you think about it. If you don't know how to do that, if all you've got is a monkey chattering away inside your head and all you ever do is try to struggle to shut the monkey up when you go to sleep, then you actually aren't going to be very successful. But if you can actually engage with this monkey in such a way that you're like, oh monkey, I actually get the language you now speak. This is what you're trying to do. The minute you actually recognize the monkey's language, the monkey goes like, oh finally, I don't have to shut you. Because you're now actually listening and having a conversation which is a more engaged and active conversation with yourself. No, that's not an act of sanity, but it is, or I should say insanity, but it is a part of how we learn to use our thinking constructively towards our purpose, towards our goals. All right, so in, we are children of time. We are intimately children of time. Our ability to perceive and think, to love, to feel the way we do, all comes to us through these three patterns of time. And these three patterns of time can be understood as the interaction between these three patterns of thought. The little dots you see in this map represent a way of actually just encoding for you which of the three patterns you use most yourself. So you'll see on the back of the pocket guys that we've all got that there are ten badges. And these badges are something very simple that allow us to understand each other at a glance. Over time, we hope to introduce these badges to become more symbolic and representative within the culture because we believe that the more we can engage with each other, recognizing the value that each of us brings and understanding the ways that we can support each other in collaborative learning and to understand the resistances that we may have and how we can help each other overcome those, the more we can do that, the more we're going to become an effective learning institution, a more effective learning institution. In other words, to actually understand thinking at the metacognitive level, to go above it, it's supposed to be in it, 
is to change the nature of thinking altogether. Einstein said you cannot solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it. You've got to see the world anew. You can't solve a problem with the same level. You've got to get out there. You've got to go beyond being inside that way of thinking to start solving the problems. And that's really what we're doing. So what we've got here is a metacognitive framework that allows us to understand the way that all concepts, all concepts arise. Whether those concepts be about facts, knowledge, information, research, data, whether those concepts be about um, the challenge, the immediate problem in front of you, where hope and ideation and creation and creativity and vision and imagination come into it, or whether it be more about structure and organization, and how to get things done, either as a group or individually, and the way that you each are going to participate in the structure and process. Whatever they're about, you actually can work your way backward from almost any problem you're confronted with, and you can actually use this model to figure out what's really going on. What is the thing that's happening? The interaction between me, my thinking, someone else's thinking in a relationship with it, or is it between me and my professor, and the way that the professor thinks and teaches versus the way that I learn? Or is it actually more to do with the material or the content, which just happens to be very much of this kind of content, using needing this kind of thought process, and I don't have much of that. Whatever it is, you can actually use this to start to figure out what's really going on. And as you do that, it liberates you from being stuck in the problem. Because you've actually now looked at what's going on, as in what system is at work, that once I understand the system, I can actually begin to master it. Give us an example. Yeah. I can. I mean, for years and years and years, um, I studied Latin when I was at school. And it was a real problem for me. And I realized that after a while, the idea of learning something wrote, of actually sitting down and having to decline verbs, for example, on no, mass and math, and mama, and mass and math, I can still do it to this day. Why? Because it was beaten into me. I mean, quite serious. And if you think about it, to make something stick in memory by using a stick, it's not really very accessible because all I did was go throughout life going, Latin is the worst, most horrible thing in the world. Which is a really silly thing because we all have to deal with Latin, whether you're in law, whether you're in medicine. You know, Latin is in many ways a foundation of many languages. So to develop this antipathy, to develop this resistance to something because of the way it was taught to me, set up and accept me for all kinds of stupidities in my life. So I wish, and I didn't at the time, but I wish that I had known that my particular way of learning was through experience. Now, someone had actually said, hey, you know what? Here's a play in Latin. And you take this part, and you take this part, and by the way, at the end of the day, because he's up on the balcony, or she's on the balcony, and you're down, but you get to kiss her. Right? That's your incentive. <laughs> now, you play that role, and you play that role. That actually probably would have been a really, really good way for me to learn how to speak Latin, or how to understand Latin. Because there would have been an incentive, there would be an experience, there would be something actually happening as opposed to sitting down by myself with a book trying to decline a bunch of verbs. Now there were other people in my class who were absolutely brilliant at declining those verbs. They were really, 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 really good. And so for me, it was not only the fact that I wasn't good at it, it was the fact that I was both good at it that made me feel as though I actually was failing somehow, that I was not as good as them. Do you see how, and we do this throughout our lives. So there are an infinite number of possible examples of how it is that we actually try to measure ourselves against other people who do things supposedly quite easily, and therefore we put ourselves down, not realizing that we have an entirely different and valuable gift to actually bring in different situations. As you think about it, just quickly, I'm not going to ask you to necessarily say that now, but I want you to think about each one of you. What is it that you find really easy to do? If we were to sort it between coming up with ideas spontaneously and organizing things really well and learning from books, I mean, a historical founded perspective. Just think yourself, if those were the three choices, which one of those you would show up and go like, you know what, I'm really good at that. That's how I bring value. Can you do that? Just nod your heads if you can actually realize what that is. Yeah, it's not hard. It's not hard. How many would choose the future one, that possibility? I'm great at problem solving. Okay, fine. How many of you would choose the, I'm really good at organizing things? Give me that task, I'll do it. Okay, 
And how many of you are good at that third one, which is, give me the facts. I will wait, I will sort through a few more. So right here in this room, we have a distribution of thinking styles that even without actually having a profile, which by the way is online and you will get to the one, even without having to take a test or anything else, you actually can start to sort out that we have far more present thinking in this room than we have future or past. In fact, might you be on your own in the future thinking? And we would be turning to you, almost on your own, but we'd be turning to you to actually come up with smart ideas right at the last moment. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. And then the rest of you would be incredibly good at organizing that once we have had the people who have a lot of past thinking figure out whether Mike's idea was actually worth pursuing in the first place. So if he came up with the idea, and the past thinkers went like, that's a great idea, then we would turn to the present thinkers to then organize and execute on that idea. Do you see how this works? All of a sudden, everyone's got a role. Perfect. Very much like collaborative learning. It is collaborative yeah. learning. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It is a collaborative learning model. This is how we actually can help each other. Not just here in this room, but all 1,500 students and all 100 and however faculty members. It's all one great big learning system. And we release the power of that great big learning system when we actually know what the system at work really is. And that's what we're really talking about here. Are there any questions just off the back so far? Does this make sense? Do you get how powerful it could be in life if you actually are enlightened to what thoughts are going on? Not only in your learning, but in your relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, with uh, people you hire maybe one day, people you need to work with as teams. Do you see how suddenly you can actually start to make things a lot easier for yourselves? Yeah? Is this beginning to make sense? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces, and I'm not sure whether you're agreeing internally or whether you're actually agreeing. So some large arcs nodding heads would help me. I think our students are very much in the here and now. You know, test coming tomorrow or what, you know. Yep. And, um, yeah. So you all are getting this. <laughs> good, good. That question. Are you going to um, kind of resolve the, the, uh, the issues of overcoming kind of like personality barriers? It seems like those with the same personality or learning types usually study together. And they're usually there are these cliques that form based on based on how well you get along with the person that yeah. you know, you're hanging out with. So, so birds of a feather, feather. Yeah, birds of a feather flock together. Okay, so I'm a future thinker. Who do I tend to hang out with? The future thinkers. Why? It's easier. Of course, it's easier. There's resonance. They think the way I do. I don't have to overcome their need for more information or their plans. Right? But all of a sudden, you're like, but what am I actually missing out on here? Because when it comes to the weekend, I never have a plan. So I'm looking around at what all my friends are doing, which is the same friends, and we're all thinking about it. You see where I'm, where I'm going with this? Sort of thing. Now, you can think it's very comfortable, but actually you get to be very stupid in life if you just stick with yourself. So here's this extraordinary thing that comes along that solves exactly the problem you're talking about, which is like, hey, I'm a future thinker. I really need help from some past thinkers. This is what's in front of me. And by the way, I'm offering my help, and I'm very good at this side of it, to help you Resolve problem solve, etc., etc., etc. Would anyone like to collaborate with me? Now, instead of all the past thinkers, present thinkers, and the future thinkers sticking with themselves because it's comfortable and they all can sit in their own particular way of doing it, now you've got these different minds actually showing different points of view. One plus one plus one, if it's all present thinking, just adds up to three. But one plus one plus one, if it's present, past, and future thinking, actually adds up to five. Because the power of this is that it changes the chemistry entirely. It's not just more of the same. It's the combination of things which are so different, and yet collectively together, they create whole thinking. Now imagine approaching life with collaborative learning, where the result is continuously coming up with whole thinking. Imagine that you actually had whole thinking going on when you went into an exam. <laughs> Not that you just learned the way that you learned so that you can answer the questions that we thought were going to come up, but that you actually approached this in the sense that you understood all three fundamental aspects of what it was that was in the midst of that exam. That's the power of collaborative learning. When you have a framework to sort out the various different things that people bring to the table to avoid the tendency which is to simply be with people who you resonate with most easily. All right? So that is really the, a lot of the power of this. 
One of the ways for us to grasp this and to really understand is that in every moment of every day, I will guarantee you, in every moment of every day, your thought patterns, your thought patterns are driving you to behave in a certain way so that you can have a certain experience. This is why we're trapped in our thinking. So if you have a lot of past thinking, your thought patterns will drive you in such a way so the experience you have is one of believing that you understand the meaning of things. That you have the ability to understand the meaning of things. So there's a safety, a security in actually understanding the meaning of things. Are you nodding your head because it's you? Yeah. And it's really interesting because it really doesn't matter whether it's in a relationship, driving a car, whether it's actually taking an exam, whether it's going to a lecture, whether it's talking to your parents. That is always the fundamental experience you're trying to have if that's your primary thought pattern. And it's quite amazing. You can be going to the movie. And it's the same thing. What are you doing? You're sitting there trying to figure out the meaning of what it is that you're sitting in front of you. You can be watching a soap opera. It's the same thing. Well, likewise, if you're a present thing, the experience you're trying to have is one of stability. That everything is just flowing and unfolding exactly the way that you planned for it to un unfold. And you know that you even have stability should something go wrong. Why? Because you have another plan. The plan B. Why? Because you anticipated that plan A might not work. And that feeling, that present thinking is trying to give you, that experience is one of being in control. Just simply being in control. That no matter what, you've got it figured out that you're in control. And if you have that future thinking, the experience that you're really trying to have is the experience of excitement, of novelty, of change. So this means that, yeah, okay, you leave a little bit late. Why? Because all of a sudden you've got to be really smart how you get there faster than you normally would get there. Which, of course, results in many great fine conversations with people of the law. And those conversations for the future thinking person trying to have that experience of thinking on their feet and being problem solved actually is just another part of the experience that they really want to. Why? Can they talk their way out of the speeding ticket that they're about to get? It's called artfully dodging and it's a part of what future thinkers are trying to experience. Can you actually get out of trouble once you've gotten yourself into it? Yeah. Future thinking doesn't. Why? Because the experience it's trying to have, the experience it's trying to have, is one of being quick on its feet and problem solving and always seeing the new possibility. The new possibility. Lots of ideas, but don't expect it to actually sit and execute on those ideas itself. That's not the experience it's looking for. It's looking for the pat on the back for the idea. So those three experiences combine in various ways. And all of this, when we really get down to it, if we go out of our egos, we would see they are, we are quite simply trying to recreate that experience in every situation and context that we're in. Now, after today, of course, you don't have to do that unconsciously. After today, you can actually recognize the fact that this is something that you're not only doing, but is driving you to have the life that you're having. So after today, it's no longer a habit, it's actually his choice. There's the difference. We can move it out of habit and we can move it into choice. And by moving it out of habit and moving it into choice, it gives us the power to actually make a decision as to do we really want to have that experience just for the sake of having that experience? Or can we actually understand this as a way to overcome the need for the experience and to actually engage in the outcome that we want to have? I want to pass my exam. I want to actually learn from this particular lecture. I want to actually sit with a group of people who can actually help me to understand this. Or I want to offer myself in service to others who are finding it difficult to understand this. <coughs> or I want to improve the quality of my relationship with my significant other. This can actually now lead to an enormous amount of intentionality. An enormous amount of what I call response ability. The ability to respond. That's a Personally, a very powerful way to live. It's a very powerful way to live. All right. So we're here. We have this map. And when you take a profile online, and by the way, you can take a profile online if you want to go and visit the cards, that QR code and that URL. Lots of details there of how to get there. So you can take that profile. It doesn't take very long at all. And what it does is it locates you within this map, this framework. So you will know how much past certainty, present probability, future possibility, thinking how those are blended to create 
your own particular thinking style. The badges, I won't go through them now because it's a little bit lengthy, but the badges are extraordinarily simple. And just to show you, they, they just like make intuitive sense what you look at them. And again, they're on the back, so you don't have to remember this. But future has a future present part to it. In other words, almost equally future and present, and it has almost equally future and past. So those are different. Those are different from each other. Both of them lead the future, but one is more organized and the other one is more informed. And then you can have past with future, which is informed with some spontaneity and some idea generation, or you can have past with present, which is information with order and structure. And again, none of these are right or wrong. And present with past, which is structure and order with good details, accuracy, or present with future, which is structure and order with a goal, with an objective, with something that you're trying to reach to strive towards. And then integrated. And I was just settling on this one for a second, because a lot of people are actually integrated, as in they use all three of these in almost equal amounts. Barack Obama, President Obama, he's a high integrated thinker. A lot of people think that he is not a good leader. Why? Because he doesn't lead for one particular tribe in one particular way. But everyone acknowledges that he's incredibly good at building bridges between factions. This is what the integrated thinker does. The integrated thinker is that kind of thinking that can see the other point of view. In fact, the most frustrating thing for an integrated thinker is to be amidst, in the midst of people arguing, when actually they're arguing from these three different perspectives. And they go like, yeah, no, you're right, but so is he, and so is she. It's like, well, come on, can't you just get along? All right, look, I tell you what, I'll come and talk to you. You tell me what it is that you're saying, and I'm going to talk to that. And they become the go-between, they become the consensus builder, the bridge, the glue in the group. They tend not to be good leaders. These are not people who charge out in front of saying, there's the possibility. Why? Because the minute they actually have that thought, they go like, yeah, but what do I know about it? And as they're learning more about it, they're like, well, how do I actually do that? And so you see that they integrate all three of these perspectives. And so other people are waiting for the leadership piece to step up. But in reality, what they're doing is they're listening here, they're listening here, they're doing here. They're moving between three. So the integrated thing. Very important. There's the constellation, if you will. Ten different archetypes, as we call them, the money time archetypes. So any one of these is what we would refer to as a thinking style, a thinking style. There are many measures of thinking styles in the world. My time is a relatively unique one in that it's not looking at personality, it's not looking simply at learning style. It's looking at what we believe is right at the very, very foundation of the genesis of all human consciousness and perception. Those of you who are interested in human consciousness at the very origins, cosmology, if you will, of our conscious awareness. There's a paper that we just have published in Cosmology Journal, which is online, and I will give you a URL or something to it later, we can send it to you. Because it's kind of interesting when you stop and think about it, everything that you will do in your entire life, every thought that you will have, every experience that you will have, is being had in our belief as a consequence of the interaction of these three dimensions of time. It has huge, huge implications. All right, this is the pocket guide that you've got. I don't need to go through it, but obviously, there's a lot of information. It's, a lot of, it's very information dense. And the point is, there's three basic stories being told here. The one is, everyone has value to bring, and on that panel, on the inside, is really a breakdown of the essential, essential pieces that are the archetypes of thinking. There's a great deal more information online, and there's a book, which I did keep bring a copy with, but there's a book going to be available in the library called It's All About Time, which has even, even more in-depth. There's a ton of information online. On the other side, what we're dealing with is two things, other than the badges themselves. We're dealing with, one, how to collaborate. In other words, how do you actually bring different people together? And the second thing we're dealing with is, how do you move information around this map of thinking in such a way that you really use it the most constructive way you possibly can? You really use it the most constructive way you possibly can. Okay? So that's the pocket guide. And 
We will also make available to you these slides as a PDF if you want to. Um, this, will be, this will be actually online too. Yeah. So yeah, they can learn about a week or so you can learn about it. Absolutely, great. So the PDF is on the video will be online so that it has availability. And by the way, you know, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to actually reach out into the culture of San American University, both within the faculties, also the student body. Can you imagine the power of this if every student here at San American University actually understood not only their own thinking style, but how to relate and interact with everyone around them, both their professors as well as their peers? That actually, if they learned these very basic principles of how you collaborate in your learning together, it could be really, really extraordinary. And that's really what the vision is here. The vision is, is to provide this as a tool, as a suite of tools, with lots of information and access to it, so that you can all learn about how you learn, not just learn about the profession that you come here to learn about. Because that second task of learning about the profession will be made a great deal easier if you actually understand how you go about proceeding and learning in the first place. So do tell your colleagues about it. Do tell your friends about it. Encourage them to get involved. Take some extra pocket guides if you want. And give it to them just to get them intrigued. Because once this actually starts rolling out, you'll find that the combinatorial effect, the additive effect of more and more people actually thinking this way, will start to shift everything. It'll start to move everything. Patterns of human learning and patterns of human engagement, they are entirely built around our ability, rather, these thought processes and our ability to integrate them. So if you think about it, no, no two people, or I should say, two people who do not actually occupy the same place on this map, do not have the same style of learning, and they do not have the same style of being engaged with. So, of course, this has huge implications for when you're communicating with each other. In this pocket guide, it also has that, that little line that says, to connect. This is in each of the things up to connect. And what we mean by that is if you're trying to connect with somebody, and they're of that particular thinking architect, this tells you, like, oh, leave yourself at the door. You may not actually be well understood if you just speak from your own perceptual framework. This is how you connect with that person through this. And if you make an effort to do that, do you know how much nicer you are as a human being? It actually changes the way people experience you if you're actually trying to connect with them the way they perceive and are in the world. It kind of breaks that communication barrier down because there's no barrier anymore. Why? Because you just stepped across it. This is a hugely powerful thing in life. You have no idea. And then I'm 54 years old. I promise you, when I was in my 20s, I had no idea how often in my life I would come across a situation where a simple understanding of communication would either you know, change the situation entirely, get me out of trouble, and it would certainly ingratiate me with them. Just simply understanding how communication works. You will be amazed how many times in your life, whether it's in crises, in your marriage or your work, whether it's in a situation where all of a sudden you're having to work with someone and you need them to really understand what it is that's going on, but there's this urgency to it, You'll be amazed how the skill of communication, the skill of being able to put things in a way that they engage with, that they understand, will make an enormous difference to your professional and personal lives. Enormous difference. In business today, I promise you that communication skills are one of the most taught, and uh, more money is spent on communication skills within businesses than almost anything else in terms of training. It's that important. <clears throat> Now you have in front of you a very simple methodology to actually understand how to communicate more effectively with people who think a different way, how to engage them in what it is that you're saying. So if you did nothing else but actually pick this up and actually read that back and so became conscious in your every single interaction with another human being of asking yourself that one question which is, how do they think? What value do they bring is a different way of asking the same question. Do they bring the value of possibility, probability, or certainty? But what are they, what are they trying to do? What experience are they having? If you can ask yourself that question, at the very least, they will feel you're being more empathic, and they will love you for it. At the very least. And at, at the, the most, what you'll do is you'll be a heck of a lot more effective at getting your message across. It's quite a rewarding thing to be able to do. And the more you practice it, like anything else, it's a muscle, the more you use it, the more you will do it very effectively, and it will change the nature of your interactions with other people. 
Okay, the last thing I want to touch upon is some friends of mine, the Iroquois Confederacy Pig Indian tribe that used to be around back in the 1700s. Amazing, amazing, amazingly, this tribe, some of you have to leave us, but don't all leave. And I'm going to be done in literally two, two minutes, three minutes. So the Iroquois Confederacy basically had this extraordinary insight. And if you picked up a packet of seventh generation toilet papers, you would be able to read the back of that packet of toilet paper. There's the most brilliant of insights that I've ever come across. And it says, in our every deliberation, we must consider the seventh generation before taking action. In our every deliberation, we must consider the seventh generation before taking action. What it's basically saying is this. As you're coming up with these bright ideas, before you actually implement them, you should actually consider what the implications of the idea are. Go and do the research, in other words. And it speaks directly to the mind-time framework and how we can consciously move information between people <coughs> from the ideas, future thinking, to validation, past thinking, and then to present thinking for execution. So this really gives us a very substantial way to think about how we collaborate with each other and how each of us brings value and to recognize that value at the right time in the process of working together. And very lastly, the thing to do always is to mind the gap. To be clear that you actually cannot communicate into the gap between you and the other person. It's not, I'll meet you halfway. There isn't a halfway between thinking styles. You've got to reach across. You've got to communicate across the gap to connect. And so this idea of coming halfway, which is often what I hear in communication, which is like, oh, just meet me halfway. You know, this compromise. It doesn't actually work in communication. It always falls into the hole in between the two people. So in order to make yourself understood, take the onus of responsibility on yourself to actually be the one to use the information that you've learned here today. And to practice this and actually understand that you can become a more effective human being, you can become a more effective partner, a more effective professional, if you begin to understand how to use your thought patterns to communicate across gaps, to work with people and find their value, to bring them into collaboration so that all of you benefit from the actual differences that exist between them. Okay. Any questions? A lot of information. Yeah. I've passed out evaluation forms if you fill those out. Great. Very yeah. helpful. Terrific. Thanks all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.